transport material is directly related to its flow velocity. Even slight variations in flow rate can lead to significant changes in the sediment load transported by a stream. Several factors influence flow velocities and, therefore, control a stream's potential to do its work of transporting sediment. These factors include, 1, channel slope, or gradient, 2, channel cross-sectional shape, 3, channel size and roughness, and, 4, discharge, or the amount of water flowing in the channel. Gradient The slope of a stream channel, expressed as the vertical drop of a stream over a specified distance, is called gradient. Portions of the lower Mississippi River have very low, or gentle, gradients, about 10 cm or less per kilometer. By contrast, some mountain streams have channels that drop at a rate of more than 40 meters per kilometer a gradient 400 times steeper than that of the lower Mississippi. Gradient also varies along the length of a particular channel. When the gradient is steeper, more gravitational energy is available to drive channel flow. Channel shape As water in a stream channel moves downslope, it encounters a significant amount of frictional resistance. The cross-sectional shape, a slice taken across the channel, determines, to a large extent, the amount of flow that comes in contact with the banks and bed of the channel. This measure is referred to as the wetted perimeter. The most efficient channel is one with the least wetted perimeter for its cross-sectional area. Figure 16.10 compares two channels that differ only in shape, one is wide and shallow, the other is narrow and deep. Although the cross-sectional area of both is identical, the narrow and deep one has less water in contact with the channel, a smaller wetted perimeter, and therefore less frictional drag. As a result, if all other factors are equal, the water will flow more efficiently and at a higher velocity in a deep and narrow channel than in a wide and shallow channel. Figure 16.10 Influence of Channel Shape on Velocity The stream with the smaller wetted perimeter has less frictional drag and will flow more rapidly, all else being equal. Channel Size and Roughness Water depth also affects the frictional resistance that the channel exerts on flow. Maximum flow velocity occurs when a stream is bank full, before water starts to overflow its banks and inundate the surrounding floodplain. At this stage, the channel's ratio of the cross-sectional area to wetted perimeter is highest and stream flow is most efficient. Therefore, greater water depth increases this ratio, which in turn increases channel efficiency. All other factors being equal, flow velocities are higher in large channels than in small channels. Most streams have channels that can be described as rough. Elements such as boulders, irregularities in the channel bed, and woody debris create turbulence that significantly reduces flow velocity. Discharge Streams vary in size from small headwater creeks less than a meter wide to large rivers with widths of several kilometers. The size of a stream channel is largely determined by the amount of water supplied from the drainage basin. The measure most often used to compare the size of streams is discharge the volume of water flowing past a certain point in a given unit of time. Discharge, usually measured in cubic meters per second or cubic feet per second, is determined by multiplying a stream's cross-sectional area by its flow velocity. The largest river in North America, the Mississippi, has an average discharge at its mouth of about 16,800 cubic meters, 593,000 cubic feet, per second, figure 16.11. That figure is dwarfed by South America's mighty Amazon River, which discharges nearly 13 times more water than the Mississippi. Geographic 16.1 presents more information on Earth's major rivers. Smart figure 16.11 The mighty Mississippi near Memphis, Tennessee. The Mississippi is North America's largest river. From head to mouth, it is nearly 3,900 kilometers, 2,400 miles, long. Its watershed encompasses about 40% of the lower 48 states and includes all or parts of 31 states and two Canadian provinces. Average discharge at its mouth is about 16,800 cubic meters, 593,000 cubic feet, per second. Photo by Michael Collier. Mobile field trip. The Mississippi River. Hello, I'm Michael Collier. On this field trip, we'll be flying over parts of the Mississippi River to see how the largest river in the United States flows from its source to the sea. 75 million people live and work in the 31 states and two Canadian provinces that make up the river's drainage basin. They all need water from the river to live here, and at the same time, they all use the river to dispose of household, industrial, and agricultural wastes. On our way downstream, we'll try to understand how the Mississippi grows and flows, how it creates landscapes and its floodplain, and how people have come to live and work alongside it. The Mississippi's official source, or headwaters, is Lake Itasca, 
1,475 feet above sea level in northern Minnesota. Let's travel downstream, 2,340 miles to its mouth where the river empties into the Gulf of Mexico. This is more than just one river. Tributaries add water from the whole basin, more than a million square miles stretching from the Rocky Mountains to the Appalachians. That's 41% of the contiguous United States. Only the Congo and Amazon River basins are larger. One major tributary, the Missouri River, is actually twice as long as the upper Mississippi above their confluence. Another, the Ohio River, delivers a lot more water to the main stem channel than the upper Mississippi. Go figure. But rather than debating about which branch is the longest or carries the most water, we can think instead about an entire basin with multiple tributaries, the Missouri, Ohio, the upper Mississippi, all coming together to form the main trunk of the single mighty river. The Mississippi River is dynamic. It's always changing. Did you know that its current flows faster along the outside of a bend than on the inside? Because of this difference, water erodes the outside of a bend to form features called cut banks. Water on the inside moves slower and tends to drop its load of sand to form point bars. In this way, the river continuously creates loops called meanders. But when the next flood rolls through, the Mississippi might cut through one of these loops, shortening its course and steepening its gradient. By this process, oxbow lakes can form when a meander is totally cut off. The river could change course overnight, or it might take many years to change. Time enough for a town in, say, Tennessee to wake up one morning and find itself in what suddenly become Arkansas. A river's drainage basin is defined by its wettest tributary, the longest stretch of a river from headwaters to mouth, the total area from which a river's water flows. A drainage basin is the total area from which a river's water flows. At its mouth, the flow or discharge of the Mississippi averages just under 600,000 cubic feet per second, or CFS, by that measure making it the eighth largest river in the world. The river's discharge is hardly constant, though. Floods radically change the river's personality. High flow events on the Mississippi are not brief flash floods, but rather are regional floods that build and subside over many days or even weeks. In 1927, high water forced almost a million people from their homes, not quite 1% of the United States' total population at the time. During the flood of 1993, 75 communities were underwater as a million CFS rushed past St. Louis. Further downstream in 2011, more than 2 million CFS swept past Vicksburg, Mississippi. Discharge is one measure of the river, but there's also the flow velocity or speed of the current. You might think velocity would be controlled primarily by the river's gradient, that is, by how much the bed drops over a given length of channel. But you'd be wrong. Gradient matters, but discharge matters more in determining the Mississippi's flow velocity. The basin's tributaries, for example, plummet thousands of feet as they first leave the high Rockies and the rugged Appalachians. But by the time it passes Mark Twain's home in Hannibal, Missouri, the main stem Mississippi has less than 500 feet left to fall before reaching the Gulf, 1,260 miles downstream. Even though the gradient of the remaining riverbed is low, the river flows faster here than in its upper stretches. And at flood stage, the lower Mississippi can accelerate to 8 or 9 miles an hour. With increasing velocity comes turbulence and a dramatic increase in the river's ability to erode its banks and bed. There is also a greater ability to carry sediment downstream, either suspended in the rushing water or rolling and bouncing along the bottom as bed load. In 1927, floodwaters inundated 27,000 square miles along both sides of the river from southeast Missouri all the way to the Gulf, submerging some communities and fields under 30 feet of water. Of course, floods like this are catastrophic, but they're part of the river's natural behavior. Before the advent of artificial levees, floods would build natural levees as sand grains settle out just beyond the river's normal banks. Beyond these levees, high water would often cover the Mississippi's floodplain that stretched up to 70 miles beyond the river's edge. This level, fertile floodplain has been plowed into farmland that now helps to feed much of our nation and the world. A greater load of sediment, however, has always been carried on downstream to the river's mouth. As the Mississippi approaches sea level at the Gulf of Mexico, it slows down, breaks into channels called distributaries, and begins to drop its prodigious sediment load something like 230 million tons a year. The result is a massive delta. 
The building blocks of the delta are a mix of 